All right, let's uh, talk some of the macro situation with Vincent Dillard, always with a unique look at the market and the economic picture. He's the director of global macro strategy at Stone X Group. Uh, Vincent, welcome back to the show. Uh, one of the main headlines from your recent note is that the disinflation of the past year was uh, more uh, luck than skill. And as they say in uh, poker, and you also quote Napoleon, it's sometimes it's just better to be lucky than good. Yeah, that was... Uh... I actually watched the uh, the Ridley Scott movie. Um, yeah, hey, Harry don't King. start hating on events. No, not 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 accurate. Um, <laughs> very depressive. Even the battle scenes, which which I expected to be fantastic, but anyway, the reason I was bringing up Napoleon was because he famously said, you know, I, I'd rather have general lucky generals than than courageous ones. Uh, and um, I think yeah, we, we may just have gotten lucky last year, and and we are witnessing. Uh, the generals, uh, in our case, Powell and Yellen, uh, claiming a lot of credit for ultimately things that were a bit out of their control. Uh, you know, the, the reopening of China was not as inflationary as expected. Uh, they boosted supply rather than demand. We had a very warm winter uh, in, in Europe that really eased some of the pressures um, on the uh, um, on uh, natural gas. Uh, and then we had a normalization of supply chains. So, yes, CPI fell. Uh, but uh, if we look at the true underlying drivers of inflation, uh, they have not gone away. And my expectation is that we'll have a probably we actually already saw the low. I think that that print at three percent was the low for the CPI, and that last percentage point is is just never going to come down. Mm. Think that's going to carry over to PCE on Friday. We shall see. Uh, one thing that I find uh, interesting about the, the PCE is the uh, relatively larger weight on on healthcare. Uh, so healthcare has been one of the drivers um, uh, downward of that that disinflation, miraculous inflation of last year, and in large part it's statistical illusion. Uh, according to the BLS, we had a, a 50% drop uh, in uh, health insurance costs, which is laughable for anyone who actually pays with health insurance, uh, and that that gets rebenchmarked at the end of the year. So we, we're going to see that come back up and, and maybe catch up. So I don't think PCE falls as much as CPI has fallen. Uh, and then broadly speaking, uh, if you look at the inflation picture, the drivers of the disinflation of last year, uh, or sorry, three cases, um, three arguments of disinflationary case. Uh, one is, is shelter. Oh, like, you know, shelter is lagging, and, and then that's going to kind of catch up with a lag of, of housing prices. Um, I don't see that. I mean, housing prices actually are all-time high. If you look at um, uh, the cost of rent on zero, it's it's kind of stabilizing around 4%. So, And you see signs of light in the housing market, especially as we've seen these mortgage rates come down. So I, I don't think we're going to get that that disinflationary uh, uh, tailwind from, from shelter. Uh, the second case was about core goods. Uh, and then we have seen this inflation. It's real. It was a supply chain. It's a used car. But again, the question is, is that going to continue? Uh, we, we're not going to fix the supply chain every year going forward, right? It's a one-time event. And on top of that, we have to worry about uh, shipping issues, both the Suez Canal with the, the, the Houthi issues and, and also the Panama Canal, which is running at about a, a two-third capacity right now. So that, that's going to feed into uh, higher cobus inflation next year. And then the third part is what I mentioned, this kind of statistical illusion uh, with health services. So I put all that together and I'm like, okay, this is, you know, we 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 had the the, the dividend of, of falling prices. We already collected it, uh, and and now we have to look at the hard reality, which is uh, that wages are still growing by four or five percent. I mean, that's what you see now: average hourly earnings, the Atlanta Fed. Um, so, um, yeah, this may this may have been as good as it gets on the inflation side. Mm. Uh, yeah, as we've uh, stabilized here, the decline seemed to have definitely slowed. If you could. Uh, Right. Uh, if you could buy or sell options on this chart of three month annualized inflation, would you say it's a scenario where you would be selling puts or like selling put spreads as opposed to buying calls? Or would you really be buying upside? Because I do feel like that's relevant for the Fed's path. Inflation not going down, not ideal. It's still better than inflation going back up a lot. Right. So. I mean, to me, the, there are two trades that are um, fairly obvious on that. One is uh, short-term so far futures, uh, so interest rates. I mean, we have uh, bets uh, on, on six rate cuts uh, up to 2024. Uh, the Fed had penciled three in the SCP. Now, keep in mind, this is not a promise. This is all else equal type of analysis. 
So anywhere between that six and that three, I, I think that three even is too high. I, I don't maybe they cap once or twice next year. Uh, but so that that's the obvious trade is, is being long rates uh, for, for 2024. And by the way, that trade worked in 2023 and 2022. I mean, the, the rates market has always been um, uh, forecasting these uh, uh, dovish people, right? I mean, this is the third time we've seen the movie now. Uh, so that would be the first one. And then the second trade is, is long-term inflation swaps. I mean, if, if I'm right about inflation resetting to, um, you know, let's say three, four percent, where that that two percent instead of being a, a ceiling for inflation becomes the floor mm -hmm. uh with, with you know a range of, of, of three to four percent this is absolutely not uh, in the break evens or, or in the swap curve so yeah. um yeah. that's um that that's the inflation trade and um i i i do believe we were going to see this uh play out uh in, in 2024 fairly rapidly uh, there's another way uh, to look at this in a chart. I want to uh, come back to your point about the inflation that's easy to bring down, the stuff that's stickier, cyclical versus acyclical inflation. Acyclical, the blue line here, uh, I guess, would be the supply chain linked uh, and cyclical being the one that's still very high, even though it's come off the, the top. Uh, and then uh, these are these are baskets that you, uh, you've made um, or is this, this is this a Fed measure that you're using? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me give a little bit of context on this chart. So this is one of the. I, I feel you know a lot of uh, triumphalism on, on the um, uh, on the deflationist side, and, and people saying oh inflation is over, and and then and, and they point a bunch of charts, and one of them was the one you had before, this three month annualized. Every time you see people bringing up measures that you've never heard of, um, I, I think you need to be careful. This is one of these, I think it was made by the San Francisco Fed, and it, it breaks down inflation between cyclical and cyclical. And I think the idea there is to show that, oh, we, we're going back on trend on the acyclical basket, uh, which sounds good until you look at it. Uh, and then you look at, you know, in the acyclical basket, you have things like airfare, you have things like used cars. Um, and, you know, I mean, that doesn't seem cyclical, right? When, when I think about a cyclical inflation, I think about wages, I think about expectations. Uh, I think maybe about housing. Uh, I think about services, but certainly not something like used cars. So this is, again, one of these measures that, you know, and I, I don't, I think they did it with a regression, a Phillips curve-based regression. Uh, so it's just, I'm not, I'm not claiming ill intent here. It was a, somehow a, a quantitative outcome. Um, but uh, I think it gives a, a somewhat misleading picture Mm. Uh, to me, the, if I really think about what is a cyclical inflation, what is second inflation, uh, it's thing like like wages. Um, you know, are our workers getting good pay raise? Yes, they are. Our workers going on strike? Yes, they are. Do workers have a lot of, of power? Yes, they are. Our workers, how do how do people generally feel about inflation? I mean, if if you go and and make a survey, you know, very few people agree with the narrative that inflation is gone. I mean, for them, it's just everything still costs 30% more than last year, and that bakes into inflation expectation eventually and, and behaviors. So that's my view when I when I said that the inflationary embers are are still red. Uh, it's not this kind of quantitative, oh, if you slice the data this way and you take the three-month annualized, maybe you can see that we're already at target. To me, this is a lot of cope. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is not real, but I'm saying this holds all the luck to luck, uh, and that these lucky factors are unlikely to be there uh, in 2024. And in 2024, what we'll see is probably more geopolitical disruptions. We will still have, you know, these almost two trillion annualized deficit. Uh, we'll have a, a proactive Fed, a Fed that cuts rate when core PCE is running at three percent, something that has never happened uh, in the past 35 years. Um, to me, that's a recipe for what usually happens after a first wave of inflation, which is a second wave of inflation. Mm, okay. So if uh, the Fed, to stick with your uh, theme in the note, if the Fed's uh, battle of Austerlitz has been getting us down back into the three-handle, when do they go too far uh, and overextend themselves? Is that by doing too many cuts too soon? Uh, that, that's a good analogy, yes. Uh, this is, I mean, this is the story of hubris, right? I mean, either your, your Jeep... It, you're smart or you're lucky, and then you you, you overextend your hand. And and uh, I, I think we certainly saw some of that I, at the November press conference. I, I was shocked by how uh, Powell, how confident Powell sounded, and then and, and the Governor Wall also, uh, if we are uh, not now opening the door to more cuts. Um, you know, there may even be um, 
um, I think there is a a desire for of the Fed to uh, declare victory, or almost like with another military analogy, uh, George W. Bush in uh, in Iraq, you know, in two thousand three, you know, he yeah. was on the aircraft carrier, yeah. he has the mission accomplished, signed the back, right? Uh, at that time, you know, he kind of knew already there was no WMD in Iraq. Uh, Iraq was not, you know, involved in 9-11 in any way. Uh, he opened a can of worms. So his best shot was to, hey, cool victory and hope everybody forgets it. I think the Fed is the same mentality. They, you know, obviously overstimulated, over eased in 2021. Uh, then inflation came and, and now they have this miracle, right? Like the, the victory of the U.S. troops, you know, taking over Baghdad and Fallujah. Um, and, and it goes really well. Um, now it's not not of the doing. Uh, most most of this inflation really of 2023 was made in China, not in the U.S. But hey, I'm gonna take it. Say hey, okay, case closed. Let's no longer talk about inflation. I think that's what's going on. All right, understood. Vincent, always appreciate the conversation. Uh, we'll have our own movie debate another time. I thoroughly enjoyed the romanticism of Ridley Scott's uh, Napoleon. But oh, we'll, we'll, another debate for another time. Can't let you close on that. This is awful. No. <laughs> I'm a lover, not a fighter. You know, I like... I love. Josephine was 15 years older than him. I mean, how... <laughs> even that part of the movie was completely mind-blowing. All right, well, out of uh, re respect for your uh, for your native language, I will cede the argument to you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Vincent, a lot. Stonex Group.